jointly improving the level of water security and the utilization among the Lantang Mekong countries. Thank you. That is CP Tunes Tom Bo right outside the Great Hall of the People. Tom Bo, appreciate your reporting today. Thank you. Let's continue our studio discussion with my guests here, Professor Xiaolu and uh, current affairs commentator Einar Tangen. Uh, gentlemen, we understand three ministers will be addressing the media shortly. They're from uh, technology, water resources, and information technology. Professor, what do you look forward to finding out from the ministers? Um, actually, we are looking forward to uh, hearing kind of the general plan for the next uh, five years or 10 years or 15 years of China's uh, uh, strategy on the uh, basic research uh, innovation and its uh, stipulation to the national economy and also the social development. We also uh, look forward to hearing some kind of the green energy plan, you know, for example, just like the irrigation or the water resources, the preservation, the, the, the employ of the water resources. Actually, that's another example of China's kind of uh, vow to reduce the the carbon uh, emission to the outside world and to the, the China's vow to you know, do the green energy, to uh, promote the green energy. So that would be our kind of uh, uh, expectation in the uh, minister's kind of corridor. Yeah. All right, Honor, pick your favorite. <laughs> well, actually, I was kind of intrigued by the combination because you have water, which is a necessity. I mean, mm. we, we can't live without it. Uh, but then you, you're really talking about the economic future of China, especially as it goes to technology, the, you know, the, uh, the situation with the U.S. in terms of embargo of chips and things like this. And then information technology. Now, this, this is something that affects uh, people uh, in terms of their privacy. Uh, the Chinese government has been uh, at the forefront of trying to make sure that you know technology, I mean that information, the information you get on all these social media platforms, on these sales platforms, Alibaba, Tencent, etc., that it's not being sold or used in ways which is un, you know against your personal interest. So you know in 2013, people were very upset because uh, you know Xi Jinping started talking about a sovereign internet. This idea that r countries in v will eventually have to be responsible for everything that's generated in their country and going out and also everything coming in. Uh, recognize that the internet was a you know, two-edged sword. So, but today, you know, we see the necessity of this. And it's not just China acting. You, you have the same uh, types of uh, actions in the EU, uh, even beginning in the U.S., you know, with all the actions against uh, Twitter and Facebook, etc., like that, against these tech titans. There's a realization that things have to be done responsibly. Just because it's in cyberspace, it's not physical, doesn't mm -hmm. mean that there won't have to be laws. And that feeds into things like the metaverse and all of these types of things. So I think it's a, a very good balance in terms of the economics, uh, necessities, and also you know, the social uh, aspects. I wonder if the, uh, the Minister of Information Technology will use this opportunity to further talk about data security. That is mm -hmm. a big topic. As we heard from the work report from Mr. Li Jianshu, that was also a highlight of the legislative work last year, coming down hard on data security and making sure that that security is not breached for the Chinese people. I mean, this isn't exactly something you go about your daily lives worrying. Right, but uh, you know, unless unless your identity has been stolen and somebody's emptied your your account, and that is a very real risk. Very real. That is a very real risk. Um, what are we doing in this regard, in particular, Professor? And um, could we see more measures to protect people's data security this year? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and according to the report just now, uh, the uh, data security, especially about the ind individual, the personal information, actually should be uh, uh, viewed as, the, uh, as a privacy. And the people, not only people, but also the enterprises should show respect to this kind of pri pri privacy. Well, some of the cases show that uh, they don't uh, actively violate this kind of privacy. They just, you know, uh, by, by accident just uh, violate the privacy. But they should, uh, you know, uh, uh, raise their concern, raise their kind of the uh, perception about the, how significant this personal information or individual information matters not only to individual but also to national security because national security nowadays has already become more and more in practical in detail it, it involves each and every person's kind of security so what each and every person's security combines together makes the security of a nation of a nation state so that kind of sense of security should be you know um, let's say learned and uh, absorbed by 
by each and every one in nowadays China. And it's not just China that is worried about data security. The U.S. also, in the case of TikTok, U.S. regulators said this could um, be a very real risk for American users of TikTok, whether their their data will be secure on Chinese servers, and that caused a huge um, brawl between the two sides. Your take on this? Well, I mean, it, it's it's moving. That's why I was talking about this sovereign internet. The idea that there's a responsibility of governments to protect their people going both ways. So, in terms of that, you don't, you know, Americans don't want their personal information and profiles being processed in China in case there's, you know, some leak or something、mm. like that. And the same is true the other way. China has acted to make sure that you know there isn't <laughs> U.S. companies harvesting the data of Chinese people and using it in ways that could be against their interest. So this this is、uh, very important going forward. You know when we you know, I was saying when we start talking about the metaverse, people think oh it's it's just out there it doesn't matter. But the metaverse is going to be just like. The,、uh, the the reality we live in. There has to be rules. There has to be laws. There has to be protections. So people should, you know, start trying to get their head around this idea that a virtual world is the same as the real world, except you're not touching anything physically. Absolutely, gentlemen. Do bear with me here for the moment. Now, one, two, three, four, five is China's citizens hotline. Residents can use it to make personal or public complaints and requests. My colleague Jiao Yang filed a complaint about shared bikes parked in the wrong place. Let's take a look. You ask, we respond swiftly. That's what Citizen Hotline One Two Three Four Five promises. We're going to see if they can deliver. Beijing shared bikes, a wonderful idea for getting around if you don't want to risk getting stuck in traffic. You can pick them up anywhere and return them mostly anywhere. But what makes them convenient is also the downside. This ends up happening. This is my neighborhood, and I come across this from time to time. Cars and pedestrians have to skirt around or squeeze past, and not to mention it's a bit of an eyesore. So I'm going to give one, two, three, four, five a call and see what they can do about this. Hello, Mr. Lin Shao, can you help me? Hey, you. Hello. Uh, I'm just want to confirm that I live in this little village. There are cars and pedestrians squeezing around, and I want to see if you can help us with this. It's in the village of Sanli Tour, and my neighborhood is on the right side of the road. The road is on the right side of the road. The road is on the right side of the road. The road is on the right side of the road. The road is on the right side of the road. The road is on the right side of the road. The road is on the right side of the road. Right. So the operator said that、uh, they will contact the local areas authority for me to see what they can do about this, and if that, they can't do anything, then it'll be up to the district authorities. They'll contact them as well. But it's up to a seven-day wait for a response, so we'll have to wait and see. The city wants to use one, two, three, four, five, and the data it collects through them as a way to identify hotspot issues and proactively deal with them. And at the very least, it's useful for average citizens to have a platform to have a say. I got a call back from my neighbourhood about 24 hours from placing the call to one, two, three, four, five, and clearly I am not the first to complain about unruly bikes. So it turns out they have an instant messaging group, and I just have to take a picture, send the location, and somebody will come and clear the bikes in about half an hour. So in this group, there are all the、uh, various shared bike companies, local businesses, and I assume just local residents like myself. Hooray! For now, I'm just clearing the bikes. It's an endless cycle. So I was told that、um, the neighbourhood will be designating parking areas, and that's in the pipeline for the year. 
It's a, all in all a fairly decent response. I actually got uh, two more callbacks within the week. Another one from my neighborhood and also one from 12345 again to check that uh, I had uh, been contacted and to ask if I felt satisfied with the response. So, Rob Tower programming to bring you live to the Minister's Corridor in the Great Hall of the People. The fifth session of the 13th National People's Congress now will begin in its second minister's corridor. Today, the media center has invited three ministers to meet the press and answer your questions. The uh, Mr. Wang Zhigang, Minister of Science and Technology, Mr. Xiao Yaqing, Minister of Industry and Information Technology, and Mr. Li Guoying, Minister of Water Resources. Now let's invite on stage the first minister. Thank you very much. Good morning, dear friends from the media. And this is the first time the Minister of Science and Technology is accepting questions at the Minister's Corridor since 2018. Now the floor is open for a question. First question, please. Thank you very much to the moderator and also to the minister. I'm with the CMG. We are implementing a lot of policies regarding science and technology. My question is, what policies do we have in strengthening basic research, in stepping up investment, and also in incentivizing the enthusiasm of innovation of science workers? What policies do we have? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. This is a very important question. Let me tell you at the outset that last year, we have implemented a number of science and technology policies that have played an important role in supporting China's socioeconomic development. Let me share with you a set of data. In 2021, investment in science and technology reached 2.79 trillion RMB, up by 14.2 percent year on year. The investment intensity reached 2.44 percent of China's GDP. And in terms of output, we have supported the commercialization of some of the science and technologies. If you look at the economic revenue and also the total volume of contracts, we have uh, more than 3.7 trillion RMB. And that has far all number the uh, 2.79 trillion RMB of investment, and also China's innovation now ranks uh, 12th in 2021 from the uh, 34th in 2019. So we are putting on ground a number of policies for science and technological development, and this is a key area of our job, because we know that the policy will play a guiding role, it's a driving force, and it's also, it's also a guarantee. So over the past year, we have entrusted, uh, we have uh, undertaken some of the key tasks, and we hope that those policies are truly put on the ground. And there are different dimensions of our work, and number one, we follow comprehensive guidance and we engage in systematic handling of those policies. There are a number of instructions from the CPC Central Committee and the State Council. And on January the 1st, we released the new version of technological progress law. And there are new instructions put forward by the Ministry of Science and Technology. And there are also a three-year action plan. All these are top-level designs, and we will come up with substantial actions, and we formulate a list of the actions, and we see to it that all the actions are put on the ground. Number two, we will make sure that all those actions are taken. In so doing, we're going to focus on some of the key areas, just as you have mentioned, we're going to step up basic research. Basic research and frontier research, they can dramatically expand the horizon, and they can also prom prom provide a lot of momentum for other researches. So that is why we attach great importance to basic research.
We hope that in the new year we can uh, make some uh, important breakthroughs just like uh, the last year where we have uh, worked out a new synthesis of uh, carbon dioxide and also uh, methane um, based oil and those are important breakthroughs last year uh, we are targeting at serving China's social and economic development, serving China's national strategies, and also improving people's livelihood. And these are also key directions and orientations of our work in the new year. We hope that science and technology can truly play an important role in supporting social and economic development, in ensuring high quality and development and safety of the international industrial chain and supply chain, and also improve the business environment I mentioned there is the technological progress law and also three-year action plans, and we have other policies and regulations. We're going to further refine them by focusing on scientific and technological workers. We will mobilize the enthusiasm of uh, Santec workers in innovation and also focus on talents. We know that the activity, the activity of science and technology are basically the activity of human beings. So we have to cultivate talents, uh, encourage them to truly get engaged in science and technology so that they can flourish and succeed in whatever they do. And this entails that we focus on the cultivation of uh, talent teams, and also we have to pay attention to young talents, uh, the youth, the, uh, the future of the country, and also the future of science and technology. And this is also a key area of our job. Uh, we have some uh, special programs enabling young scientists to get engaged in scientific exploration so that they can truly demonstrate their talent on the platforms that we have established so that they can truly advance the scientific progress of the country. And last year we worked together with China Women Federation. Uh, we uh, formulated a proposal to make it easier for women scientists to get on board. And we removed the limitations on age and just now, as you probably have heard, that at the beginning of the session, and there was a congratulatory message from the chairman of the standing committee of the NPC uh, to all the women. And uh, here I would like to send out a sincere congratulation to all the women technological workers. Uh, last but not least, I hope that we can form a collective strength, different localities, universities, institutions, and different social sectors, they can form a collective strength so that one plus one is truly larger than two. We can truly uh, maximize the effectiveness of our effort. We can pull the strength of all sides in science and technology, and together we can make some meaningful uh, breakthroughs. We have to put on ground those very important policies. We are working together with all the Santec workers and also different uh, units such as higher education as institutions and also different social sectors. We have to work closely together and form a collective strength. By pulling uh, strength from all sides, we hope that more technologies can be commercialized and delivering substantial uh, benefits to Santec workers. Next question, please. Thank you. Good morning. I'm from Daily Finance. So improving the innovation capacity is very important for the enterprises, and this is also a key concern issue. So what measures will be taken by the Ministry of Science and Technology to consolidate the principal role of the enterprises and how to boost our support to those SMEs, especially the science tech enterprises? Thank you for your question. Yes, indeed, the enterprises are the major market entities, and right now 
we are focusing on the innovation-driven development. And these companies, they are holding a principal role in the market. Since the 40 years of reform and opening up, especially after the 18th Party Congress, we could see the innovation capacity for the enterprises has significantly improved, especially when they are making decisions and in terms of the investment of innovation, as well as the commercialization of design type achievements, these enterprises they have done a lot of work. In terms of the investments, as I said last year, the total investment for Scientech is about 2.79 trillion yuan, among which 76% came from the enterprises. So in terms of this intensity, we could see the investment is quite big in scale. And second, as for the commercialization of the achievements, as I said, the contract values amount to 3.7 trillion yuan and 90% came from the enterprises. Third, in terms of the organizing capacity, 79% of the plans were initiated or led by the enterprises. For the high-speed train, nuclear power, new energy, vehicles, and the Winter Olympic Games, as well as the anti-epidemic fight, all of these initiatives are actually led by enterprises. In the past, for the enterprises, they're focusing on the technology, and right now they're focusing on the basic research and also the innovation on the basic research. And the enterprises have become a leading role in this regard. Going next, the enterprises will become a leading role in the innovation. There's a long way ahead of us. So for the Ministry of Science and Technology, we will continue to show support because we have to abide by the socialism with Chinese characteristics. Because we are now in the market economy, so for these high-tech enterprises, they will play a leading role. So we are considering whether or not to have these companies take on more science tech projects. And we also need to foster a good ecosystem. And also they need to abide by the general principle proposed by General Secretary Xi Jinping. They have to consider the future direction of China and also the development of the enterprises so as to achieve a win-win outcome. And of course, the enterprises need to come up with more talents. For example, how to pick the talents from 1.4 billion people. And also, the enterprises need to play a key role during the collaboration between the enterprises, universities, and the research institutes. Some of the leading enterprises should lead the innovation with the SMEs. So no matter what is the size of the enterprises or the property of the enterprises, all of these enterprises could be served as the main body for the innovation. As long as they have this capacity, they could make their contribution in the innovation. And for the science tech companies, they need to become the leader for the innovation. For the SMEs, they also need to find their specialty in terms of the innovation so as to pursue more progress and further development. So SOEs and also the private enterprises, they are the same in terms of creating innovation. And also China will have set up the high-tech zones to promote the innovation. For example, the Zhongguanzun and other high-tech zones, they also facilitate with the innovation. As I said, in terms of the investment, the enterprises contribute 76% of the investment, which is above half of the investment. And most of the investment actually come from the high-tech enterprises and in the high-tech zones. We also need to consider the per capita, which generates three times of the outcome. 
And also we have to consider the energy consumption of those innovation companies. And of course, for high-tech companies, they will provide a driving force to promote the high-quality development. We will continue to follow the innovation-driven development in China, and hopefully for these high-tech companies, they can foster a healthy ecosystem. Thank you. Next question, please. Good morning, Mr. Wang, from China Daily. In recent years, in the science tech area, actually we have made some of the achievements of foreign cooperation. So what are some of the measures taken by MOFT for further cooperation for the development of science and technology depends on the foreign exchanges? Opening up is the fundamental policy for China. As General Secretary Xi said, China will open wider for our doors. Especially, I want to emphasize that for the opening up for the science and technology, and in the future, we will continue to boost the cooperation with other countries. For the opening up, first I would like to mention the government, the Chinese government, has built up the cooperation mechanism with over 120 countries and over 20 international organizations. Under this mechanism, through cooperation, we have done a lot of exchanges for the science and technology, and also we work on different projects. And also, we made a lot of progress in terms of the development of the industry. For example, during our anti-epidemic fight, we work with the United States, the United Kingdom, Malaysia, South Africa. Altogether, 17 countries we have formed cooperation. For example, we facilitate them with the uh, vaccine development and the drug development and the testing tools development, etc. And last year, we also signed up 21 agreements on cooperation. And also, we are focusing on the um, cooperation with the universities and the R&D research centers. So we conduct this cooperation at grassroots level. So it is not just at governmental level. And also, we are focusing on the um, sign tech cooperation in different aspects. And also, we have a lot of people-to-people -people exchange. So last year, we received over 3,500 young scientists from different parts of the world. And also, we are continuing to expand the scope for our cooperation, for example, the sustainable energy, anti-epidemic fight, etc. All of this area will continue to push forward for the cooperation. So we want to make sure that the sign tech in China not only serve China, but also we will make contribution to the world. And at the same time, we will also learn from the science and technology from other countries. We will learn from each other and also progress together and make our own contribution to build a shared future for mankind. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you very much. I'm with uh, Guangming Daily. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, the Ministry of Science and Technology has organized a number of scientific work providing guarantee for people's health and livelihood. What are the recent arrangements in this, as, in this regard? And what plans do we have going forward? Thank you very much for your question. And you just asked this question with your mask on. This shows that the COVID-19 is still ravaging. But over the past two years, we have basically contained the outbreak here in China domestically and there are a lot of success factors and one of the factors being science and technology. On the afternoon of March the 20th, 2020, uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping paid a visit to 
the front line of science and technology. And he said that we have to obtain an answer, a solution from science and technology. So we focused on drug development, vaccines, nuclear acid testing, epidemiological uh, surveys, and also uh, origin tracing. We have five technical roadmaps. Over the past year, a lot of progress has been made in vaccine development. Uh, traditionally, we have uh, three inactivated vaccines that have gone public. Uh, last year, we have uh, added one uh, reorganized potent vaccine. Uh, for the other two technical roadmaps, there are uh, progresses already, and we have a uh, mRNA and uh, DNA vaccine that have entered the third stage of clinical trial. So our technological workers, they are uh, making their own contributions with dedication and perseverance. In terms of drug development, we have one innovative drug that is already on the market. In the meantime, there are three different uh, uh, treatment uh, drugs, they have also entered stage three for clinical trials. Some of the Chinese medicines are currently uh, under uh, development and they are showing great prospects. We're witnessing a lot of variants, uh, the Delta variant and also the Omicron variant, and we're asking whether it's possible for us to come up with a universal drug that can cure all the different variants. And we're currently researching and developing such uh, drugs. And traditionally, we have to get vaccinated by taking a dose. Maybe in the future, we can get vaccinated in other uh, formats. We can inhale the drug, and we can also uh, take a pill, but the progress is not very uh, satisfactory. This is mainly due to the fact that we do not have a lot of cases. Everybody is paying attention to COVID-19 prevention. We are wearing masks, we are washing our hands often, and we are practicing our zero COVID case policy. So that is why a lot of the research is they are conducted overseas in association with our counterparts in the United States and also in other countries. So we are the leading organization for this very important part of our job. Technology must play its role in COVID-19 prevention. The more technological means we have, the more effective our COVID-19 policies will become. In the meantime, we are engaged uh, another uh, task in, the 20, in 2013, since the SARS epidemic, we took a while, but during this uh, COVID-19 epidemic, we spent only 70, uh, seven days to come up with the uh, genome uh, drawing. And I forgot to mention the nucleic acid testing kit. I can tell you that Within 30 minutes, you can have the result of the NAT, and also one NAT system can cover more than 200,000 samples per day. We have dramatically improved the capacity of nucleic acid testing, so this is due to technological progress. When the COVID-19 pandemic is behind us, and what legacies do we have? And one of the legacies might be the routine policies against infectious disease, and when an infectious disease uh, come about, we can quickly initiate some of the uh, procedures, and what kind of technologies and uh, practices we will uh, leave behind. I believe we will have a lot of uh, the very good practices and also the partnership of science and technological cooperation. So I believe that the next time we have a infectious disease, science and technology are ready and we will have a more uh, powerful uh, toolbox. Thank you very much, Minister Wang. Thank you to all the friends from media. Next, let's bring on stage our second minister today.
Thank you very much to the Minister of Industry and Information Technology, Mr. Xiao Yaqing. Dear friends from media, good morning. And now the floor is open for questions. First question, please. Thank you very much. I'm from uh, Beike Finance News. In the government work report this year, there was a specific part talking about China's steady economic development. And may I ask you, Minister, how well does China perform in terms of industry and information technology? And what are the problems that we have encountered? And what solutions do you have to troubleshoot these issues? Thank you very much for your question. The CPC Central Committee and the State Council pay attention to the steady economic operation of the country, and this is very important. Uh, from January to February, we followed through the decisions made by CPC Central Committee and the State Council in some key areas and key industries and key sectors. We are closely following their development and conducting service. According to statistics, from January to February, our economy has maintained the momentum of a steady and healthy development. Different localities and different sectors in particular, the enterprises on the market, they are doing a great job. And they have made a very obvious uh, progresses. So basically, we have maintained the very good momentum that we saw since the uh, fourth quarter last year. So that's why we are very confident in the smooth running of our economy. But in the meantime, we must be sober-minded uh, about the difficulties and problems that we face. For example, the rising price of raw materials and also their uh, issues and difficulties from the transportation sector and the transportation fees are on the rise and also there are flare-ups of the epidemic uh, which are obstructing our economic development and most importantly there is a changing external environment and inevitably they are bringing about negative impact to our economy so going forward we have to follow through the decisions of the CPC Central Committee and the State Council, and most importantly, we have to put on ground the policies already formulated and make sure that each and every policy is translated into real and substantial actions. And the central government has released a number of policies to boost different sectors. In implementing these policies, we must also see that Different localities have also come up with their own policies, and there are tax rebates, and there are preferential policies, there are policies that encourages innovation and exports, and also policies that boost uh, domestic consumption. We have to work with relevant authorities to uh, explain and uh, interpret these policies and also implement these policies. And also, we have to troubleshoot the problems encountered in our global industrial chain and supply chain. I mentioned the rising price of bulk commodities and raw materials and also the supply of uh, key components. And these are crucial to some industries and enterprises. So we have to be very meticulous in our work in this regard. We have to ensure a smooth channel of the uh, supply chain and uh, the uh, production chain so that we can leverage our advantages in different industries. And third, we need to pay attention to uh, high quality growth and upgrading of our industry economy. And right now, China is still in a process of uh, modernizing our industries. We are already very big, and for 12 consecutive years, we are ranking first in the whole world. However, if we're benchmarking high quality development, we still need to make a lot of improvements. These are the challenges. But we still have this potential 
To improve our development, for example, we have to accelerate the digital and the green transformation of the manufacturing industry. We have to enhance our competitiveness. Also, we need to foster more leading enterprises. As I said, we have a big aggregate. We have a huge amount of enterprises. And this year, I hope these enterprises can turn themselves to leading enterprises so as to improve the market competitiveness for our country. So by doing all of that, this will help us to stabilize the industrial economy. So with the le leading of these enterprises, the general industrial economy will be improved. Next question, please. Thank you. People's Daily. This year in the government work report, there were many items talking about the manufacturing industry. So what is your view on the development of the manufacturing development and what measures will be taken by MIIT? It's for the manufacturing industry in China do witness a rapid development since the 18th Party Congress. The central government attached great importance to the development of the manufacturing and also the real economy. A lot of measures have been taken. For the aggregate for the manufacturing industry has ranked number one for 12 consecutive years in the world. As for the major categories in the manufacturing industry, they are intact and complete. This is quite unique as compared to other countries in the world. So this will lay the solid foundation and show support for the development of China's industrial economy. So in the future, we will still put priority on the development of the manufacturing industry and the real economy. We have to exercise all the measures indicated in the government work report. First, we'll further invest in the manufacturing industry to make sure that we have increased the proportion of the manufacturing in China. For the manufacturing industry, we're actually turning from a low end to a medium to high end. And we have a huge market potential as well as many opportunities. And also for the enterprises, they also have ample room for development. We also consider the demand from the general public. And I think we still need to work harder to meet the demand for the consumers. So these are all the opportunities we have to seize. Second, we also need to pay attention to develop the cluster industry. So right now for the manufacturing industry, we have quite distinct advantages. So we have to better mobilize our existing resources and to gain better improvement. So this should be fully leveraged the advantage of the cluster industries. And also for the manufacturing industry, there were huge amounts of SMEs. The development of the SMEs is also closely linked to the development of the manufacturing industry. We have leading enterprises. We also have SMEs. So for these two groups of enterprises, we will reinforce with each other. And this is a new type of ecosystem. So in the future, we have to better foster this ecosystem to further support the development of the SMEs. And also for the manufacturing industry, we need to improve the capacity for their production. When they are marching to, to medium and high-end development, we need to 
resolve a lot of issues so as to achieve self-reliance, we have to address the key concerns in the manufacturing industry. By doing all of that, we could upgrade the industry and push for high-quality development for the manufacturing industry. By doing that, it could boost the growth of the industry economy. Also, we have to create a better environment. For example, we have to provide services, we need to provide policy support, we need to form a synergy to bring more benefits to the manufacturing enterprises. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Xiao, with CMG, CMR. My question is in relation to 5G. Many companies focusing on the development of the 5G technology. So this year, in boosting the development of the 5G technology, what measures will be taken by MIIT? Thank you for your question. First of all, I do agree with your opinion. So 5G development gave us a lot of opportunities. With the development of 5G, we are able to develop more applications, and this also laid a solid foundation for future development. On one hand, the building of the 5G network so we are leading the world in terms of the 5G network. We have one, over 1.4 million 5G base station, and also we are connecting over 500 million users. So you could feel the convenience brought by the 5G network. And also we could see 5G is applied in different scenarios. Especially, I want to mention that in the successful hosting of the 2022 Winter Olympic Games, even though you all stay at home, you could still watch the game. And it's quite an entertaining experience. This is thanks to the 5G development. In the future, we'll focus on the development of the 5G base station, because right now this is not enough. And this year, we hope we could build more than 2 million 5G base, app base stations. And also, we need to expand the application scenarios for the 5G. We want to bring more conveniences to people's daily life. And also, we want to encourage the enterprises to further innovate on the 5G applications. By doing all of that, we could encourage a wider application of the 5G technology. And during the development of the 5G, we need all the sectors to form synergy so that we could lead the other countries in terms of the technology of 5G. When we are developing 5G, we need to consider the next generation of the communication. For example, in the future, we may consider how to develop, for example, the 6G technology. So this is actually the future development plan for 5G. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. With Cover News, in the last two years, we, we always talk about the SMEs focusing on specialization, refinement, uniqueness, and innovation. And also in the government work report, it also emphasized the development of such type of SMEs. So what measures will be taken by MIIT to develop such type of SMEs? Thank you for your question. So for SMEs that are focusing on specialization, refinement, uniqueness, and innovation, actually achieve a lot of achievements in the past two years. If we look at the figure in the past two years, we could see for this group of enterprises account a big portion for the regular SMEs. However, if we look at their revenue and the profits, 
Also, the innovation. If, they if we compare these enterprises compared to other SMEs, they also surpass all these other SMEs. And this shows that uh, these uh, SMEs, they are following a correct path of development uh, going forward. We're going to expand the SMEs in specialization, refinement, uniqueness, and innovation. Uh, at the national level, we are going to further spur the development of these enterprises, expand their skill, improve their numbers, and we hope to establish more than 3,000 uh, national level uh, such as SMEs, and at the prov provincial level, we will build up more than 5,000 such enterprises. And also, uh, these SMEs, they are playing a demonstrative role. We hope that the practice of these SMEs can bring a lot of reference or lessons for other uh, small and medium-sized enterprises so that all these small and medium-sized enterprises can perform uh, very well. And also SMEs, they take a significant proportion of China's enterprises. We have more than uh, 44,000 SMEs, uh, more than 90 percent of them are small and medium-sized enterprises, so we have policies uh, supporting enterprises in specialization, refinement, uniqueness, and innovation. We have to build an environment that is preferential for these enterprises as well as other SMEs. In the meantime, we are going to support the steady growth of our industry. The further developments of such SMEs will entail the collective force from all these different sectors. There are policies from different local governments. We hope that the market entities themselves, they can take the initiative to engage in greater and higher quality of development. We have plans to summarize their best practices and scale that up at the national level and support more enterprises to become SMEs that are successful. Thank you very much to Minister Xiao. Now let's bring on stage the third minister today. Thank you very much, Minister of Water Resources, Mr. Li Guoying. Good morning, dear friends from media. Now the floor is open. First question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Water floods uh, this year, and do we have some uh, mitigation measures this year? Well, China is a country with very diverse geological and meteorological conditions. The uh, spatial uh, distribution of precipitation is not uh, balanced, resulting frequent drought and floods in numerous uh, localities. Uh, since ancient time, this has been a reality in China. Last year, the Yangtze River and Yellow River, uh, Haihe River Basin and Zhangwei River, and uh, Nanjiang River, Songhuajiang River, and uh, Heilongjiang River, and Taihu Lake, and other big lakes and rivers experienced some flood. In particular, since entering autumn, the lower and middle rates of Yangtze River saw a 
最严重的秋汛。Unprecedented autumn flood. 海河流域 ，in the Haihe River Basin and in Zhangwei River， 有实测资料以来 ，we witnessed the largest autumn flood in history. In Hanjiang River, we registered seven autumn floods, each with a、uh, flux of more than 10,000 cubic meters per second. In the meantime, the Pearl River, in particular in Dongjiang and Hanjiang River basin, we have seen the most severe droughts in 60 years. The water flux has reduced by 70%. At the、uh, Pearl River Delta, the water supply in rural and urban areas was affected in the face of very severe droughts and flood. The Ministry of Water Resources worked very hard on three key tasks. Number one, we remain steadfast to our Goals and targets. General Secretary Xi Jinping made important instructions on flood control and drought control. He explicitly、uh, requested to put in first place people's health and property and life security. On this basis, we formulated some、uh, mitigation measures, and this is the benchmark for every policy that we formulate. And this is also the fundamental target for all the actions that we take. And number two, we focus on early warning, early forecast, early rehearsals, and also contingency plans. We request that for every river basin, every flood, every reservoir discharge, and every、uh, sinking area, and also the utilization of every、uh, reservoir, and also every place that is potentially. Uh, impacted by the sorts of reservoir, we have to focus on those、uh, early warnings and early、uh, forecasts, so that we can have scientific response measures.、Uh, in so doing, we are also prepared against the different、uh, incidents. And number three, we hold firm to the bottom line of security and safety on the flood. Comes the dams, the uh, the uh, first front line to protect people's life and properties. And cutters in the field of water resources and also rescue workers. They have to mobilize the local residents and mobilize resources from different sectors to fight against the flood. Our water resources cutters, the uh. Working on the front line around the clock, mobilizing resources and raw materials and equipment to identify the incidents and to take early actions before the incident becomes a major one. In 2021, across the nation, we have、uh, witnessed. The uh, active uh, uh, utilization of、uh, 4,347 reservoirs and a total of more than 100 billion cubic uh, waters, uh, cubic uh, meters of、uh, flood have been well controlled. A total of more than 1.328 billion cubic waters were uh, safely uh, discharged through. Infrastructures and engineering solutions. We have avoided the flood in more than 1,494 uh, villages. We also significantly reduced the disaster in a number of key areas. We have、uh, maximized the protection of people's health. And life security. 
in the face of the unprecedented drought in the Pearl River in 60 years, we built up a very effective defense line and water supply line in the Zhejiang River Basin. And also we need to supply the water so as to contain the drought. We are ensuring Hong Kong, Macau, and Po River Delta can enjoy safe water supply. This year, what will happen this year? From our side, we have to take early measures to take proactive measures for the flood control, especially in the flooding season between June and August. We have made a preliminary judgment based on our forecast. In the northern part of China, the southern part of China, it is likely to be hit by flooding. And it is more likely to have flooding in the north area than the south in the southern area. And in the central area, it is likely that they will be suffered from drought. In terms of the river basin, for the Nanjiang River, Sunhuajiang River, Heilongjiang River, Haihe River Basin, the median stream of the Yellow River, Jinghe River, Fenghe River, and relevant rivers may suffer from severe flooding. In the southern area, the upper stream of the Yangtze River, the west side of the Pro River, Zhuhe River, may suffer from regional flooding. In the central area, for the central part of the Yellow River and the Hanjiang River, may also suffer from regional drought. But this is a preliminary forecast. And in the future, we will continue to make dynamic monitoring and dynamic forecast for the flooding and the drought situation in China. And we also publish the information in due course and make relevant preparation. And of course, we will stay committed to three areas of work. First, we have to make our target clear. First, we have to put people's life and uh, property safety as our top priority. Second, we have to do a good job in forecasting and issue early warnings and make early plan plans. We have to be prepared for all of these natural disasters. Third, we have to stay committed on safeguarding the bottom line on the safety. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you, Xinhua News Agency. Good morning. In January, for China, it has actually published a 45-year plan for the water resource safety initiative. So what is the purpose in drafting this 45-year plan in terms of the water resources? In drafting this plan, I would say there were several goals of significance. General Secretary Xi Jinping emphasized the importance of the water conservation, and also we need to better manage the water resources to ensure the safe drinking water. Also, we need to respond to the requirement to the 14th five-year plan and the long-range plan by 2030. 
And when we look at the 14th five-year plan and also the long-range plan by 2035, if we look at the specific section on the water resources, we think we need to promote the high-quality development on water safety. We have to improve the capacity to ensure the safety water, and also it will lay a solid foundation for China to build itself into a modern socialist country. Improving the capacity to ensure the water safety, this is the objective for the guideline. Under such guideline, we have to look at the actual situation of the development of the water resources. I would divide them into four sub-objectives. First, we have to improve our capacity in handling the flooding and the drought. Second, we have to better conserve the water resources. Third, we have to improve our capability in allocating the water resources. Fourth, we have to do a good job in the ecological governance for the major rivers and lakes. In order to fulfill all of these targets set by the plan, there were actually six roadmap for us to achieve the goal. That said, we have six point measures. First, we have to improve the anti-flooding mechanism for the river basin. And second, we have to build up the water safety network for the nation. Third, we have to recover the ecological environment in the rivers and the lakes. Fourth, we have to build smart water resources network. Fifth, we have to establish the plan to conserve the water resources. Sixth, we will provide more legal foundation to protect the water safety. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. With Legal Daily. My question to Mr. Lu. So CPC Central Committee that has great importance to the accountability system to protecting the water resources. And also this has been included into some of the policies in China. So what is the implementation for the accountability system right now? For the accountability system, is proposed by General Secretary Xi Jinping. And he personally promoted this reform. And for this mechanism, it's approved by the CPC Central Committee. And this is also an innovative measure proposed by the CPC Central Committee. And this will protect people's legitimate rights and fundamental interests. And this will also address the most concerning issues troubled the general public. And this will also pay a lot of attention about the water environment, the safety of the water, and the river basin issues, etc. This will also meet the needs for our people to have clean water and the green mountains. So for this system and this mechanism is well received by the general public. At present, for the implementation of these accountability measures, we have seen three major achievements. First, we have fully established this accountability system for different localities 
They have to party to work together with the government. They have come up with this accountability mechanism for the rivers and the lakes. Among the 31 provinces, municipalities, the party officials will become the general leader for this accountability system. At the provincial, municipal, county and township levels, we have established more than 300,000 river chiefs and lake chiefs. At the village level, we also have the accountability system, and this includes uh, river patrollers and lake patrollers, which total to more than 900,000. So up until present, I can say that each and every river and every lake is well managed and protected by designated personnel. Second, our work mechanism has constantly optimized at the national level. We uh, formulated the uh, inter-ministerial uh, uh, joint meeting mechanism and the organizer is from the State Council. Uh, Eighteen ministries are working closely together to strengthen the coordination and uh, organization of all the river chiefs and lake chiefs, the Yellow River, Yangtze River, Huaihe River, Haihe River, and the Pearl River, and Songhua Jiang River, and Liaohe River, and Taihu Lake. All the seven river basins are, work, are working closely together with the accountability office in their local jurisdictions, focusing on river basins. We are also coordinating efforts from the upper stream and lower stream and different relevant authorities. A joint mechanism has been formulated at the provincial, municipal, and county level. There is a river and uh, lake chief office. Right now, we can support coordination and exchanges between different layers of the government, and that is to say that for every river and every lake, we have a very complete regulatory framework. Third, the ecology of rivers and lakes has been dramatically improved. Different localities are leveraging this accountability system for rivers and lakes. We are looking into the water disasters and water environments and water resources by taking targeted measures. We are well preserving the ecology of all the rivers and lakes. We are also cracking down on illegal behaviors that undermine the environment of lakes and rivers. In the meantime, we are accelerating our efforts in restoring the eco-environment of lakes and rivers. With all these efforts, the looks of the rivers and lakes have improved dramatically, and more and more rivers and lakes and river basins have uh, revived with a better eco-environment, and they have become an invaluable asset bringing um, benefits to the local people. Next question, please. Thank you very much. I'm with the Beijing Youth Daily. The fifth plenary session of the 19th uh, CPC National Congress mentioned that we have to uh, follow through the major decisions made by the uh, long-range perspectives. Uh, can you tell us more about it? Thank you for your question. Since ancient times, China has featured flood in summer 
and droughts in winter, and there is more water resources in the south than in the north, and more drought in the north than in the south, and this is the general landscape of uh, meteorological conditions in China. And throughout history, we have seen frequent uh, disasters such as uh, flood and droughts. So the national level of uh, Water Network Project is a major one, advocated by General Secretary Xi Jinping, who is also the core of the CPC Central Committee. And this is a major national project related to water security, and this is a major strategic decision. The target of the National uh, Water Network Project is to comprehensively improve water security and safety in China, and also optimize the water resources distribution system, and also improve the disaster relief mechanism at different river basins, and coordinate inventory and the incremental resources, and strengthen uh, connection between different river basins. And fundamentally, the target is to provide a water safety guarantee for socialist construction in China. The construction of the National Water Network project has to follow the following principles. Number one, it has to accurately and correctly follow through the new development concepts. Uh, following the requirement of high quality development, we have to coordinate and development and security. And number two, we put water uh, conservation in the first place and pay attention to spatial uh, balance. And number three, follow the law of natural uh, environment development and also uh, follow the principle of uh, Follow the mechanism of uh, reviews and deliberations on major water-related projects. The key of the National Water Network uh, project is to focus on three different elements. We have to focus on major rivers, lakes, river basins, natural waterways, and major and water uh, transfer programs, the major channels of waterways. Uh, these are the main structure or the backbones of the National Water Network project. And also we have to look at another very important element, and we have to look into the connectivity of different uh, lake, lakes and rivers, and also pay attention to knots. By not, I mean those controlling reservoirs and water resource infrastructures that embodies the control functions uh, through those uh, major rivers and lakes and different river basins and different reservoirs and water resource infrastructures. We have to constantly improve the national network for water resources. When fully completed, the National Water Network project will feature sound functions, safety and reliability, conserving and efficient, green and uh, smart, uh, cycling and smooth, and also orderly management. Thank you very much to Minister Li. Thank you. Dear friends from the media, and this is the end of this morning's uh, Minister's Corridor. This is the uh, 15th Minister's Corridor since the first session of the uh, 15th uh, National Congress. And uh, since 2020, despite the COVID-19, we have well maintained the mechanism of the Minister's Corridor. The passion and enthusiasm haven't reduced uh, here, I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to all the friends from the media. Thank you very much for covering the Minister's Corridor. I hope that we can meet each other once again next year.
That is the minister's corridor and three ministers, three ministers took questions from the press. They are from the ministries of science and technology, information technology and water resources. Each minister uh, took about four questions from the press and they shed light on some of the most pressing topics in their area of expertise. Helping us break down what they said is Professor Xiao Lu from Renmin University and current affairs commentator Honor Tang. And again, this is a very rare opportunity for the ministers to face the press directly throughout the year on a more regular basis. It is uh, lower ranking officials working under them, their department heads that address the media and engage with the media. So again, this is a very rare opportunity and occasion. A lot of ground covered there. Professor Xia, let me ask you about what stood out for you and from which minister? Um, the general impression from these three ministers are that uh, they all had very good memory and they all, well, uh, they are all good at their uh, jobs because they uh, know what they are doing and they they are know not only about the kind of a general philosophy of governing they also know some kind of very practical details in you know, how to you know promote things how to you know put into practice how to go uh, put all this policy down to earth well uh, one of the most uh, important or impressed kind of image for uh, for me is the uh, um, uh, uh, minister uh, uh, Lee from the water resources and uh, he mentioned that a lot of um, about the water security and the water safety. Actually, that reminds me about the uh, overall national security uh, uh, perspective promoted by uh, President Xi Jinping in 2015. So water security or water resources security actually is one of the component or one of the indispensable component of the state security. We all know that, but we all we tend to ignore this kind of thing, but that is very uh, important. I, I believe Mr. Tanga has more about this kind of uh, water security thing, right? As someone who is equally good at memorizing stuff, I well, don't. Yeah, I, well, I've been involved. I mean, water water security is actually a very technical. And what you saw there is, I mean, it's it's a little bit hard going for somebody who's not involved in government to listen to them. But these are administrators. They're not. This is not a Korean soap opera where you expect a surprise every minute. Mm -hmm. What they're responsible for is implementing policy. They have to act collegially with other ministers. They have to harmonize things. So a lot of it's seemed a little bit general but in actuality it, it's it's just this issue about getting things done and what I was uh, in, in terms of water security it, it is simply about the mechanisms it's very boring stuff you need sewers all right you need water treatment plants you have to make sure that you're not putting pollutants in and this is all you know kind of bureaucracy laws regulations inspections it, not exactly immediate stuff but Absolutely, as you pointed out, this is absolutely necessary. If you don't have water, you're going to have war. Mm. And we're seeing that in different parts of the world. So th this is the boring side of government that has to be done because your, your life would be forever changed if you don't have these kinds of essentials. But what impressed me most was, uh, I, I, I like the, the first one, the uh, uh, information and industry report. Um, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the scientific and technology. technology. Um, you know, the emphasis that this is depends on human resources, that it's about investment, about how you organize it, the kind of cluster development. And, and in terms of resources, China is putting about 2.4%. They're going to increase that uh, of the GDP is being put into that. U.S. is still somewhere around 3%. But like military spending, it's not always how much you put in but how much you get out. And China right now is really showing its chops, I mean, with 5G, uh, the next level, 6G, uh, getting involved in the standards uh, that's in, that are involved in doing that, uh, creating the next set of, of communication standards is very important because if, if you have something great and I have something great, they can't communicate, mm. it doesn't work. So this, the systems have to be uh, seamlessly uh, created. So China has a great future because of the way it organizes. And I think uh, the three of these three demonstrate that, you know, all, all the stuff that you have to do is getting done. Mm. Uh, on that note, I do want to follow up on what you just said uh, from Minister Wan, uh, the Minister of Science and Technology. He mentioned the work for the ministry 
in a in a, a guiding way, in a guiding principle, because at the end of the day, it comes down to specific enterprises that champion China's innovation, uh, scientific innovation. But in terms of what the government can do, what is the ministry in a position to do to help those enterprises? It's it's always a partnership. You know, when you try to do innovation at the state level with state enterprises, it doesn't work very well. I mean, mm. you, you can see that in the United States at the Pentagon, a twelve thousand dollar hammer and things like this. Um, you know, in China, it has to be, what, 76% of the investment is coming from the private sector. The real innovations have been coming from that side for a long period of time. So it has to be a partnership. The, uh, the government can set up the conditions, all right? They can set up platforms. But in the end, you have to uh, identify uh, human resources within your country. You have to bring in outside uh, resources, and you have to uh, let them get along and do it. That means you have to protect IP, all right, intellectual property. And China has done an incredible job of doing that. If you start looking at the American Chamber of Commerce, they have said there's been steady progress year by year for the past more than uh, seven years. So it's a very important. There's just a lot of the details and regulations that go into doing this. So yeah, it does sound boring, but you know what? 40 years of progress, hard to beat. All right, and thank you so much for both to both of you for making it less boring for us. No, Anur no, no. Tangan and Professor Salu, appreciate your time and your analysis today. And with that, we come to the end of our special coverage today on the second plenary session of the MPC. Our coverage on the two sessions continues here on CGTN. Pandan will be right in with Global Watch. Do stay.